I'm pressing and I think we'll take a break when the High Commission arrives and then we'll resume. Um, I just want to say a few words about uh, the impact which might have on me. You will hear from uh, Umra and Andy about their experience. I knew him as a child, as a teenager. I think he saw me first when I was six months old when my parents brought me to London and he was at the High Commission here. He was a very good friend of my mother, Shkunta Masani, and of my aunt, Mera Masani. They were sisters in law and they did not get on. And Kushwan managed to be friends with both of them. And they were both rather beautiful women and intelligent, and that's what Kushwan particularly was very good at. Now, uh, I, the main impact Kushwan had on me, apart from knowing he was a good friend of my family, was his history of the Sikhs, which in many ways encouraged me to become a historian. And um, I have his book here, and I would like to open with a few of the comments he made, which, this was in the 1960s. It was reprinted in the uh, 2004 or mention. But I, uh, you know, I'm very struck by how balanced he was about the Sikhs, how irreverent, even though he was very much a Sikh himself, but he was very open to criticism. And he did not, uh, in any way, kind of uh, sanitize. So the book begins with the dedication to his father, Sasoha Singh, and his mother, Lady Virambai. And it uh, reflects the fact that Kushwan was very proud of their loyalty to the Raj. Sasoha Singh built New Delhi under Dutchens, was a pillar of the Raj, literally. And then if we go to some of his comments on the Sikhs and their role, it's very clear he shows how, in spite of having fought wars with the British in the 1840s and being annexed, they, by the 1850s, were very loyal to the British. And uh, the British saw them as a very useful, uh, loyal community as against both the Hindus and the Muslims. Hindus, because they did not recognize the Sikhs as separate, kept insisting through the Arya Samaj and other organizations that the Sikhs were really Hindus in disguise. And uh, the Muslims, because the Mughals uh, waged war against the Sikhs and tortured their gurus and so on. And I would just like to quote a couple of things from Kushman's uh, book, which I think are very illustrative of uh, his comments on Sikh loyalists. And he says, in one of his footnotes. The mood of sycophantic loyalty to the British can be gauged from the message of farewell sent to Lord Britain by the Guru Singh Sabha by announcing President of the Golden Temple Committee. We are solemnly and religiously bound to serve Her Majesty. Uh, our bodies are the exclusive possession of the British. Moreover, uh, the, that in discharging this duty, we act according to the wishes of our great Guru, the ever loving God, and that whenever and wherever need he felt for us, we wish to be the foremost of all Her Majesty's subjects and to move and uphold the honor of the crown. Then we reckon ourselves as the favorite sons of our Empress Mother, although living far from Her Majesty's feet, and that we regard the people of England as our kindred brethren. So this was the attitude of the Sikh elites at the time of the mutiny, and then we know that Sikh soldiers really uh, did much to sort of rescue the East India Company during the mutiny. They were uh, uh, leading the siege of Delhi and uh, felt very strongly against uh, the Mughals. This carried on in, uh, in some ways uh, into the 20th century. Um, you know, the Sikhs really kept apart from the Congress largely. And I think Kushman uh, also now coming on to an issue like uh, the Jallianwala tragedy, which you're going to hear about tomorrow. I mean, Kushman makes it very clear that the Sikhs were there. Uh, they were about one third of the crowd. But that they were there by accident, because they had come to attend the Baisaki festival, and not uh, for any political demonstration and uh, that they were caught up in this crossfire uh, by Dyer, well not crossfire, single fire by Dyer, 
but they were there just to enjoy themselves at the Baisanki Festival and had no idea this was going to be a public meeting. However, the event did much to radicalize the Sikhs and they formed their own organizations like the Akali Dal. Uh, however, the Sikh elites remained pretty loyal to the Ram. And we, as Kushwan tells us, General Dal tried to win over the Sikhs as best he could. He summoned the manager of the Golden Temple and Sundar Singh Majitya, in brackets, whose descendants still uh, prominent the Akali Dal, asked them to use their influence with the Sikhs in favor of the government. He sent out Google columns through the Sikh villages to wean them away from the influence of mystic makers and to prove that the Sarkar was still strong. Priests of the Golden Temple invited the general to the sacred shrine and presented him with a seropa, turban and kippah. So this was after the massacre. And uh, Kushwan makes no, no bones about the sort of, in some ways, naivete of the Sikh leadership. He said of all the provinces of British India, the Punjab was the slowest to respond to schemes of self-government. And of the three communities of the Punjab, the Sikhs were the least responsive. Punjabi Hindus and Muslims had the benefit of the guidance of enlightened Hindus and Muslims from other parts of India. The Sikhs had no political teachers. So this was very much his verdict, although he does describe the emergence of the Akali Dal and the move towards uh, uh, very much demanding a Sikh homeland, which uh, I was uh, you know, conscious of reading Khushwan's history of the Sikhs, that it was very much what the Sikhs wanted and would have liked at the time of partition, but were unable to get their own independent homeland. So it wasn't just an impossible demand made much later. It had a very long uh, and respectable parenting. So I'm going to open it up now by asking Kamra what she thinks. And her book is due out in October. Tell us about your book and about your own encounters with Bushwan. Yeah, hello, uh, good morning, and I'm really happy to be here because uh, I had an emotional connection with Bushwan. Uh, I think I was closer to him than to my own parents. He was like father, mother to me. And um, uh, how I met him, I do believe in distant terms, that I was looking for a job in around 1882. And he was editing the Hindustan Times, and uh, I was really keen for a job. I was going through a crisis <coughs> phase in my life. I'm, he gave me an appointment, I went there, he offered me tea, biscuits, and very polite. He said, why do you need a job? You're <coughs> there, you have got two small children. There was a need to be a reporter. Yeah. So what is the need to be a reporter? You are well dressed, you look healthy, you look fine, and you were two small children, you're telling me. So what's the need? So after that, I was a little upset, but I was, I'm a little determined sort of person. So I started writing as an independent journalist all over. So whenever I used to read my byline, he used to call me up. Those were landline days. And just polite, hello, hello, very good, inviting to come and meet me and think that I was staying in Delhi. So I said, yeah, I will, but the third was still lingering. And then later, my daughter um, and his granddaughter were learning dance, uh, Kuchipuri dance at uh, a particular place, Raja Raja Indian Dance School. So once or twice, her dog, Nana, to, uh, she, her apartment is next to Kushwan's apartment, so dancing park. Then she said, why don't you meet my Nana? I said, yeah, I will, because once I did meet him, and we really asked him for a job, he didn't get so she said, no, no, he'll be too happy to meet you. I said, I will. And the same day I got a call from Times of India that we are doing a piece on celebrity bedrooms. So can you think of five, six, seven celebrities who just opened up their bedrooms for you and to talk for two? I said, okay, let me try Kushwan again. And so I called him up. And so was sure, come with a photographer any time. And there was this boyish thing about him. He showed me every nook and corner of his home. His wife was very much around, Mala, his daughter, who just stayed across. Oh God, and you know, where they sleep and what, and who gave this furniture. So this man is like a young boy. And there was this instant connect. And then of course, late, later we used to go to Rodi Gardens for a walk. All this is, I'm talking of the 80s. And then uh, he said, you know, you must write full time, just take it up as a profession. And in a way, go ahead and offer you a job, you'll have just been a reporter. So, but then the takeoff from there, then when he was updating the history of the seats, uh, he called up OUP. 
uh, that he made me a research assistant because again I was going through a crisis phase and he said no, she'll be my research assistant, she'll collect all the facts and figures that I'll write. And then we did um, after that one book of uh, Penguin, Absolute Pushpa, and then six books with Rupa. His views he used to speak and he trusted me, we had a bond. But there was no, he hated tape recorder, so he said whatever you are talking, you just write it down, that's enough, whether it's about sex or love or marriage or no marriage. So there was a deep bond and there was something a different about the man. He was a great writer, uh, but he was a very honest man. And uh, he said he's a non-believer, but I think he did the most of the Sikhs. And I know more about Sikh history and religion and I think because I was doing the thing of the Sikh history that I'm reading it. And one day he asked me, have you been to a Gurdwara? I said, no. That time I was doing a column to the Tribune. He said, why? I said, you know how to just go. He said, no, I'll take you. I said, then you'll also come in. He said, no. He kept sitting on the steps. And he made me and there was another lady writer from the US. She just passed away with cancer. So both of us went in. And he kept sitting in the Kesa Lava. And you know, then towards the end, last end 12 years, we became very close. I mean, a lot of his personal details. In fact, as my book is coming out uh, uh, to be published by September, October by Speaking Tiger. It's called uh, the nice man and you, memories of Kushwan Singh. And there's nothing hidden in his life. And all that stuff of wine and women, I never saw that. Okay, <laughs> 7 o'clock, he would have a whiskey. And if women wanted to hug him and plant a kiss, he would enjoy. But if they didn't, he would only be too happy. In fact, he used to say at times, you know, okay, oh, he used to mention me, that obviously I don't want to mention them here, of this, this, this woman. He said, no, nah, I know when she comes, I really feel terrible, you know. Oh, and when his wife was uh, around, anyway, he took care of the wife, she had Alzheimer's. So when he would sit on a chair, and there would be little distance, and the wife there, and there was a um, caregiver with the wife. So I said, you know, why are you sitting? He said, no, I have to keep seeing how the caregiver taking, uh, I mean, taking care of her. And that, you know, he had all these things. I mean, to some very, very different. So, so much to say about him, but I think that... <coughs> well, and uh, Andrew knew him well in the 90s when you were an uh, editor of BBC World Service News and based in Delhi. So, uh, you presumably saw a more political side of him and um, a more professional interaction. Yes, I, mean, I, I pitched up in Delhi with, at that time, a less than profound knowledge of city and country in 1993. And Krishwan was, you know, he was an elder statesman of culture, a literary figure, he uh, commented about politics. Um, he had a, a reputation as being irascible, somewhat impatient, and it was rather promoted by the column that he wrote, and I think in the Hindustan Times, which was entitled with, with Malice to One and All. Uh, yeah. um, had various titles, but and, you know, for a, a sort of a, a fresh correspondent finding his way, he just thought, do you think I could actually bring Cushman up on this story? And he thought, actually, I'm not sure how well somebody who writes a, a, a column about Malice is going to take um, a call from a sort of Arvanu foreign correspondent. So, for my first couple of years in Delhi, I don't think I interacted with Cushman's at all. And then, I can't remember what it was, but some story came up and I thought, okay, Cushman's the guy. And he did, he did surround himself with a group of very elegant, erudite women. And he was often photographed with them. They appeared on the covers of his books. Um, and and they, were, they, they were people who were, um, I think, and they, women who loved Krishnam Singh, I mean, yeah, yeah. simply out of respect and admiration and friendship. Um, but I, I remember I went around to Sushant Singh Park and I discovered that Krishnam was a, was a pussycat. I mean, he was, there was, uh, he wasn't malicious at all. He was wonderfully welcoming, he was friendly, he was one of these uh, people with a very considerable reputation who actually had an interest in the person who was talking to them. So it wasn't simply a, a one-way street, it was a real conversation. And after that, um, he invited me around a couple of times to, to his, his flat, and once when he held court at the Taj Singh, 
Um, but what I remember most clearly, towards the end of my spell as the BBC correspondent in Delhi, I made a series of radio programs, radio documentaries about uh, partition 50 years on. Um, and it wasn't about the high politics, it was about the lived experience. Um, and I, of course, I'd read Train to Pakistan, which is the seminal partition novel. And apart from that, those short stories, which are different, I think, from the earliest of the partition novels, and it's, it's Syria. And I wanted to know about Cushman's own story, and I wanted to know how much of him and his experience was in that novel. Um, and he, he spent an hour talking to me, and I've still got the recording, and I've got my notes in front of me, and I've sort of been refreshing my memory uh, for this. Um, and some of it was, just, was, was in a sense magical. I mean, he started talking about being married in Delhi in 1939, when the guest of honor was Mohammed Ali Jinnah, who comes specially from Bombay. And he talked about, as a result of that, both bride and groom were completely overlooked all day, even though know, he minded too much. He also spoke about leaving Lahore for Delhi because he wanted to be present in the city at the independence celebrations, early in August 1947, going to Kasoli, and then driving down, he thought it was the 12th or 13th of August, uh, into Delhi. And then about 30 miles short of Delhi, uh, though with roads deserted, I mean, just nothing moving, he came across uh, a gang in a Land Rover, clearly threatening violence. Um, these were, uh, there were three vehicles with uh, turbulent Sikhs who were boasting about the Muslims that they killed. And Kushman was a Sikh, he was okay, he completed his journey. But the memory of that, from his own account, stayed with him. Um, and um, just you know, in terms of what he told me, he said, the sense of guilt that I've not been able to do anything to prevent these horrible killings. One just saw, one heard, one saw corpses lying here and there, the city broke the flames, and unable to do anything except foregather in our homes, Muslims and Hindus and Sikhs and drink. Later on, one said, one could perhaps have done a little bit more in saving lives or doing something. And then I got working on this novel. It was kind of guilt written. The novel was trained to Pakistan. And he said, I deliberately made myself into a pro Muslim because I thought all this had come about because of the venom we stored in our bodies against Muslims. The main character in the novel, he said, was based on his Sikh servant. The village, Manam Madra, was a village based on a village he used to visit outside Lahore because he was representing the defense as a lawyer in a murder trial, he moved it. And then there's a, there's a communist character as well in, uh, he plays quite an important role in Trent of Pakistan, so I asked him who that was based on. And he said, let me get the quote. He said, it was Daniel Latifi. Um, he'd done his bar in England, and he'd come and joined the communist party. He used to stay with me, and he was a hell of a bore. You couldn't talk to him except he started lecturing to you on Marx and the conflict between the classes. He'd go on by the hour until you fell asleep. <laughs> well, I didn't speak Daniel Latifi for the same project, but I didn't know about this. So I went back to Daniel Latifi and said, did you know you're the model for the communist character in Trent of Pakistan? He said, no, I didn't know. I'm neither flattered nor disturbed. Uh, I said, uh, Pushman Singh says, you were one hell of a bore. Uh, to which Daniel Latifi replied, I thought the recording of this is also not. It may well have been true. <laughs> At that age, communism burst upon one like a great shaft of light and one light, and one began to understand the world in a way that one did not understand it well. And possibly it did intoxicate you a bit and might have made you a bore. I'm sure it did. I, I became interested in what happened in Kashmir in 1947, and I eventually wrote a book. Um, I think um, we are going to welcome the High Commissioner, who is very kindly great in her presence. Um, would you like to come up and say a few words? No? Very, very grateful. I hope we're not going to bore you.
But uh, in that case, we'll ask Andrew to carry on. Yeah. Uh, um, have you run would you like to say? I think let Andrew finish, then I'll okay. fill So I um, became very interested myself. I'm a historian as well as a journalist in what happened in Kashmir in 47 48. And I actually wrote a book on that based on oral history and personal testimony. Um, and uh, Sheikh Abdullah himself wrote a huge memoir in Urdu. And it appeared in much slimmer form in English. Much slimmer form in English. Uh, and it says here, translated from the Urdu by Kushman Singh. So I, I said once when I met Kushman, is there much more about 47-48 in Sheikh Abdullah's Urdu original, his memoir? And he said, no, haven't read it. <laughs> I said, um, but you translated the book into English. No. I've got a copy. It has your name on the cover. And indeed, you have written an introduction to it. No, never read it. And then he said, you know what happened? You know, the Kashmir translated it. And you know, Sheikh Abdullah's reputation, a bit difficult in Kashmir. So the publisher said, look, this translator doesn't want to use his name. So, um, but we want to have a name. So can we use your name as a translator? <laughs> <laughs> And I still have absolutely no idea whether he was telling the truth. <laughs> I suspect not. <laughs> now, you uh, saw another side of him, which is more the family and social. And uh, you mentioned his uh, sort of strong attachment to his wife, in spite of the fact that he did, you know, like other women, and that was a great sort of admirer of his but um, in your case, it sounds like he also was very um, paternal and helpful in terms of your career. And uh, can you tell us a bit more about that? Yeah, I mean, I was a, I'm a journalist also, but uh, the history of the Sikhs, when he's a breeding, he made sure I was a researcher. And after that, all the um, six, seven books on him, uh, it is Kushwan Singh with the Nation. He could have, I think, done it himself, but he wanted to involve me. Uh, that is his graciousness, I should say. And he, he liked a person. Uh, there was something called loyalty. In fact, there's a Punjabi phrase used to use for friendship. Okay, you know, I can give up my life for a person if I want. But if he detested a person or if he could not trust a person, that was the end of it. I mean, he would not be rude, but he could be very cold. I mean, he wouldn't speak. But I've never seen him being rude to anybody, even people who gave crap. Tell, tell us a bit more about his relationship to Sikhism and the Sikh community, because you pointed out earlier that he didn't come into the Gurdwara with you. He wasn't, in that sense, a very observant Sikh. But nevertheless, I remember him feeling very strongly about the massacre of the Sikhs uh, after, after Mrs. Gandhi's assassination. And uh, so he felt quite sort of, uh, you know, felt for the Sikhs in a particular way without identifying judgment. Absolutely. He used to say, I'm a very proud soldier. And in fact, his earlier books on Sikh scriptures and the devotional songs. And um, I, uh, I mean, even in the history of the Sikhs, he's left something behind for the whole community and for the other communities. And at one tenth of his earnings, he would very, very quietly give to people like uh, um, some Sikh institutions, and because that is in Sikh, in Sikh scripture, that one tenth you earn, it has to go to the needy. And to be done very discreetly, um, in fact, once I remember Balan Gargi to play right, um, he was going through his divorce, and then he said, nothing to eat. Was that bad he was. And he said that the Kushwan sustained me for some years and used to give me money when the wife was not there. And he said, quietly the money is to be handed to me. I could pay my electricity bills and other things. And there were a lot of people who came to him uh, who were just budding writers or, uh, and, to, and he was there. I mean, he used to bring up publishers and again, very discreet ways of doing things. So it was something different to me. I mean, he was 
according to me, a modern day living saint, in a way. Well, I certainly recall when I uh, finished university and wanted to stay on to do a doctorate, and my father wanted me to take a job, which one was very kind enough to offer me a job at the Illustrated Weekly, which he was editor of at the time. So he was always happy to, to help people in that sense. Uh, and he, you mentioned his assistance um, for the uh, memoirs of, of Sheikh Abdullah. Right. But I think what that also uh, illustrates is Kushwan's lack of chauvinism, in that he supported the right of Kashmiris to self-determination. We very few people, my father Nino was one of them, Sheikh Jaffa Katanaran was another, Rajati was another. They demanded, you know, kept demanding the plebiscite in Kashmir and the release of Sheikh Abdullah and so on through the narrow period and into Mrs. Gandhi's reign. Uh, so Kushwan was very sympathetic to Kashmiri demands, wasn't he? He was, and it, you know, it is quite a statement actually to translate. Sheikh Abdullah's memoirs and Sheikh Abdullah's reputation. I mean, Sheikh Abdullah stood for different things at different times of, of his life. But what really strikes you about uh, Kushman is the enormous breadth of his interests and expertise. So he was a lawyer uh, who was educated for a while here at King's College. And he was a diplomat, he was a journalist, he was an editor. He was a novelist, he was a columnist, he was a polemicist, he was a historian, he was a man of faith. And, and, and all those areas of endeavor weren't just, just things that he did, but the things that he did with huge distinction. And he wore that actually quite lightly when you met him. As I say, there was this reputation which he rather uh, uh, encouraged of him as, as uh, fierce, you know, always with a glass of scotch in his hand and chasing women. But it was, it was an image which um, he liked to perpetuate. And it was one of those, you know, it was what you might call today fake news. It, it, was, uh, it, was, it, was, uh, it was an image which he rather liked but didn't seek to live up to. Uh, and, uh, uh, before we carry on, I think Rahul wants to say a few words. Yes, so, a few words. Yes, yeah. so go ahead, and then I think we'd want to hear the audience a bit, a few questions. Uh, okay, I'll come up. Would you like to come up? Yeah. yeah. Yes, you need a mic. That's okay. Okay. stay here. Well, just a few words. Uh, I thought I'd, I'd sort of say a few words about his humor. You know, um, he uh, he was very uh, concerned that in Indians should be more humorous, have more humor. Uh, so uh, I just relate a few few uh, few anecdotes. There's one which has been going around the internet about how he got into the foreign service and the interview that took place. Now, I don't know whether it's all true, but it had the ring of truth in it. And he was interviewed, this was in just after independence. Uh, he had been a lawyer earlier, but had not enjoyed uh, uh, doing law in Lahore. But anyway, he was, after that, they opened up the diplomatic service and he was interviewed. Uh, and amongst the people who were on the interview board was the famous economist Harold Lasky. So um, three of the questions that he was asked, one he was asked is, you know, why do you want to join the diplomatic service? So the usual answer used to be, oh, because I want to serve my country, you know, all that kind of stuff. But his answer was, I'm told the salary is pretty good. <laughs> so, so there was laughter all around there. And, um, and then, then the second question he was asked was, um, uh, you've been a lawyer, um, what was your experience of, uh, of law, you know, practicing law in, in India? So he said, uh, I noticed that um, in India, there's a case uh, will go on for several years, 
but the same kind of case in Britain will be over in six months. And I asked ask myself, how do lawyers in Britain make any money? <laughs> More laughter there. Uh, and then the third question was, um, do you know how many guns are fired when the governor's wife has a baby? So his answer was, um, I don't know how many guns are fired, but I know that the ABC to the governor is fired. <laughs> So, he, he did very poorly in the written exam, but in the, in the, in the oral, he got 100% marks. And that's why he got into the diplomatic service. Um, I also mentioned about, Andrew was talking about, you know, being with the BBC. I was in the house once, and a BBC team was coming to interview him. And uh, he had given me a very particular about punctuality. And the entire BBC team, with sound, cameraman, interviewer, were all coming. He had given them 6 o'clock and they turned up at 6.30. So they rang the bell. My dad said, if it's the BBC people, just tell them they are not welcome. So I had to go to the door and tell this whole team, sorry, you're half an hour late. My father said, you are not welcome. So the man pleaded, but my dad said, no, no interview. So that's the kind of person he was. And uh, let me just, um, talking about his humor, I just thought that another um, um, uh, thing which went on the internet, and it was about my father and Ayanger. Ayanger was the famous yoga guru. You know, and they both died, my father and he, at roughly the same time. And the, the thing that went around was that Iyengar was a teetotaler and a vegetarian and died at the age of 85. Kushwans liked his two scotches every evening and ate meat and he died at 99. <laughs> so this was doing the rounds. I'll just end with another, another um, true incident. Um, at the end of his column, he all, always had what was called a Santa Panta joke, which was a joke about Sadarjis, you know. And, um, and that was one of the most popular parts of his column. Um, and it was jokes sent by other Sadarjis to him, which you could edit a bit in. So once he got a letter from the SGPC, which is the highest body of Sikh authority, called, uh, which is the Shirmani Gurdwara Prabandha Committee, a very stern letter, formal letter saying, please stop your Santa Banta jokes. <laughs> so he used to write postcards to everybody. And this one also he sent back to the SGPC with just three words on it go to hell. <laughs> and he never heard from them again. <laughs> so I thought, and since we got the, uh, the, our Indian High Commissioner here, uh, Our Excellency Ruchi Ganesham, uh, I thought I would mention this. I was going to mention the beginning, but now that she's here, I thought I would just mention his sense of humor. And as I said, he worked in the British High Commission for several years, just around the corner. And he imbibed a lot of the values of the British uh, democratic values, sec secularism, tolerance, and also I think what really was most important of all was the importance of dissent. Um, that was another very important part of his kind of uh, upbringing. That was the value of the set. I'll end there now and maybe you can carry on. Yes, I think. Uh, thank you very much, Rahul. And thank you, Your Excellency, for being here. I, I think we only have about eight minutes if we're working to the schedule. So I'm going to ask uh, all of you to direct questions to any of the panelists. Uh, the gentleman here. Yeah. 
My question to Hamra. Yeah. You work very closely with uh, the country. Um, this is the time of. Uh, you can hear. Me. Uh, this is a time when satanic verses came uh, uh, in, in India. And the story goes that uh, the publisher sent him the book to proofread that. And he made some correction and sent it back to them. They made some modification and then sent it back to him. And then he said, look, don't publish it. It will create chaos and, uh, you know, hardship for everybody. Do you know anything about it, this thing? About the corrections, I don't believe, because he never touched any of his manuscripts. I mean, he's very particular about his own stuff. So whatever he said has to be, had to be published. And he did believe, um, uh, he said the writer's job is to connect people, not to destroy them. Whether it's communities, people, and um, any, any of the politicians uh, who were um, destructive in their own India or anywhere, he just hated them. So the correcting part, I don't believe, and he did believe in freedom of writing and speech, but he did not at the cost of human lives. In fact, if you read his book, um, I met him just 10, 12 days before he passed away, a week in fact. There was a uh, journalist from Britain who was visiting India, and I just happened to meet him at the ILC. So he said, I know Pushwant, and I met him last 40 years back. So can we go to his home? I said, not too well. I mean, he was well, but I said, I can't go without the point. And this was around 4 in the afternoon, so I called up and his uh, uh, cook or the other person, Bahadur, was, uh, took the call. And so he asked, then he said, ha ha, gentlemen, and I said, this with his other gentleman also, and then one was okay. So they were very happy with each other, the television was on. Mm, and Pushpan the chap with his hair, looking actually quite good and carefree. But then he saw the TV and he said, I don't know what's happening, he was very worried for India because of uh, the destruction that already started. And if you read his book, it was published in 2007 or 9, by okay, Penguin, the end of the year, he's, he's predicted. Yeah, yeah. that's better because I think it was also... Hated violence, let's put it that Yes, yeah, so India was the first one to ban the book. Who else would like to quiz us? The lady in the back there. I apologize, this is a slightly obscure question. Yeah. Um, and I'm asking because my mother is linked through marriage to um, the sister of the same family. And I'm interested in uh, Sadao Pujat Singh. So, Kushwant's uncle, um, and so Sodha Singh's younger brother. And uh, Mr. Masami mentioned the History of the Sikhs book, and I think in volume two, Sadao Pujat Singh does appear um, quite significantly because he. He had a very important role and he was present at the round table conferences. So he was very involved in the negotiations um, for the pan member of, of power. But then he sort of disappears from the book. So I just wondered whether any of the panelists uh, had ever come across him, either Kushwan speaking about him. I mean, I know he died in the 80s, so I doubt, um, certainly, Andrew I wouldn't have met him in that. Um, so that's my question. Are you able to shed any light, any of you, on anything about Sadar and Um I, um, now that you mention it, remember reading that section of his book on ground table conferences and Rujat Singh being there. And as you say, he does fade out. I never came across him. I remember meeting Kushwan's parents uh, when I was a child and being invited to uh, their home, etc. Uh, do either of you re recall his uncle, Sardar Ujasi? Oh, just one incident he told me in the context of he being not religious, definitely not religious. Mm -hmm. And I asked him, are you superstitious about myths or whatever? He said, two things happened in my life, uh, in the family or in his own life. That has made me a little prone to superstition because he said that uh, in the ancestral village Hadavi, undivided Punjab, there were severe floods and you know, dwellings were just getting washed away, etc. And he said there was this fakir, uh, I forget the name now, the fakir, uh, and he said he was being washed away. And he said my grandfather just picked him up, put him on a tree, and gave him food and clothing. 
and this is a Muslim for me. And he said he blessed from the tree top that you know, your family, both your sons are going to rule India. Or your, not India, that time that Hindustan. You know. So he said my father became the biggest builder of New Delhi, and he said my uncle the governor. So he said, I do believe, and he said, once when he was writing the history of the Sikhs in Japan, the final draft, and he should do longhand, obviously, till the end, no typewriter, nothing. He said, I felt I can't take it any further. I was revising the draft. And he said, I felt somebody holding my shoulder, and he said, as if I'm writing. And he said, I kept wondering, what's that? So he said, that made me, and he said, both the things, uh, he said, I could complete the history of the Sikhs that night and he said that's the final draw that had to go. I could tell you a little bit about yes. Yes. Uh, yeah. uh, my grandfather Soba Singh was actually not very educated uh, but he had a very good business sense you know, as, as the reader mentioned he built a large part of Delhi the other brother, Ujjal Singh, was the educated son. So he then went into politics and became a minister in what was then, I think, Pepsu it was called or something like that. Yeah. Pepsu. He became a minister there. So he was very successful in politics. And then he became, uh, was appointed governor of, uh, of Tamil Nadu. Well, before it was called Tamil Nadu, Madras. And I think he was the largest serving governor, longest serving governor of Tamil Nadu. That's all I can mention about Sudar Ujjal Singh. And uh, I have to say Kushwan's uh, book, The History of the Sikhs, is fascinating about the Sikh princes whom he was <laughs> starting with the Maharaja of Patiala, who was known for his rapacity with women. Uh, and congratulating General Dyer on his massacre. <laughs> but uh, Kushwan was very irreverent about these worthies. Yeah. And Pepsi, as you mentioned, was the association yeah. of the uh, Sikh princes yeah. uh, who got together after independence yeah. and it was a province for a while. Yeah. I, I could also mention, which I was going to mention earlier, is, you know, he had the sense of humor but also he never took himself very seriously, you know. And there was a kind of irreverence uh, that he had. And uh, he used to love showing, uh, I mentioned this earlier, uh, and Andrew, he used to love showing uh, everybody who came to his house that this letter that he received from somewhere abroad, and it was written there simply, Kushwan Singh Bastard India. And he said, look, it got to me. <laughs> so he had that kind of, you know, uh, irreverence and, as I said, never took himself too seriously. Well, Umra and Andy, thank you very much. I'm going to hand it back to Rachel, who so will much. introduce the next panel. Much. And I'm afraid I was rather jump the gun, but I, I thought Her Excellency had arrived, so I ran off the stage without properly introducing our distinguished panelists. So let me do it so, so in retrospect, though I'm sure you know them all, and now you've heard their wonderful anecdotes, you know, you, you'll know more about them than these um, brief summaries we have here. But Zaria Masani, of course, many of you will know the biography of Macaulay. Um, so he is an Oxford deep, a very distinguished historian, and many of you may have seen his recent program for the BBC on Gillian Wallaba. So a very distinguished figure. Andy Whitehead, all of us in London who have had anything to do with India know Andy very well. Um, he's, he's known for his book on Kashmir, which he mentioned, but also for his work at the BBC over many years and his, his anecdotes about Kushwan for me today were just brilliant. I mean, one about the attributed translation is one I'll cherish for a very long time. <laughs> Although two has written about Kashmir and she's, she's written short stories, very prolific writer. And I do hope their books and Andy's recent book, which many of you may have seen about Freda Beatty, I think will be available in the bookshop today. Fascinating account of an English 
humanistic came in Indian nationalists, and later a Tibetan Buddhist nun, and had a rather famous son. So you might enjoy that later on. 